When negotiating a contract, the prospective parties may say many things which are designed to encourage the other party to enter into the contract. Sometimes these statements become terms of the eventual contract. If they do not, a remedy may nevertheless be available to a party who has been induced to enter into a contract in reliance on a falsehood. After the Misrepresentation Act of 1967, more extensive remedies in damages available for misrepresentation were introduced into English law. See Section 2 of the Act. And Section 1A provides that the contract may be rescinded for misrepresentation even if the misrepresentation is also a term of the contract. For a misrepresentation to be actionable, it must be a false statement of existing fact or law. A statement of opinion is not generally a misrepresentation. See Bissett v. Wilkinson from 1927. Two exceptions exist to this. The first person expressing the opinion is aware of facts which indicate that the opinion cannot be sustained. See Smith v. Landhouse Corporation from 1884. The second exception, which can lead to a statement of opinion being treated as a false statement of fact, is where there is evidence that the person making the statement does not believe it at the time it is made. Proof that the maker of the statement was aware of contradictory facts may prove that they did not believe the statement was true. See Edgington v. Fitzmaurice from 1885. Traditionally, statements of law were not regarded as being statements which, if false, would give rise to remedies for misrepresentation. It seems, however, that now that the House of Lords has recognized the possibility of restitutionary remedies for mistake of law in Clenward Benson v. Lincoln City Council in 1999, the same approach may well apply in the area of misrepresentation. If the statement of law is not, not believed by the person making it, then the principle in Edgington v. Fitzmaurice will apply, so that the statement will be treated as a misrepresentation of one's state of mind. Let us explore the above possible misrepresentations through a list of examples. If Yorgos buys John's bicycle after being told that it's a mountain bike and it turns out to be a street bike, would we have a claim for misrepresentation? The answer would be yes, as a false statement of fact was made that induced John to enter into the contract. If, on the other hand, Yorgos told John that he thinks this is a great bike, what happens then? This is unlikely to be sufficient basis for a finding of misrepresentation as it sounds like a statement of opinion and it is not specific enough to be a manifestation of expertise or an outright lie. If Yorgos knew that the bike is faulty but did not share that information, then there is no statement which to base a misrepresentation action. Similarly, if Yorgos promised to include a lock chain with a bike but then fails to provide it, then we should be talking about a breach of contract, promise of future action, rather than a false statement. We will now move on to see the requirements for actionable misrepresentation in some more detail. In order for a misrepresentation to be actionable, it must induce the person to whom it is addressed to make a contract. This simply means that the statement must be one of factors which led the person to enter into the contract. It does not have to be the sole or main reason. See Edgington v. Fitzmaurice from 1885. The representation must play a real and substantial part of the claimant's decision to enter into the contract. See for example Red Grave v. Heard from 1881. If the misrepresentation would have induced a reasonable person to contract, the court will presume that it did so induce the representee to contract in this, in this instance. Is it possible to induce misrepresentation by silence? A misrepresentation generally requires an oral or written statement. There are, however, some exceptions to this. First, it is clear that in certain situations, conduct can be treated as implicitly making a statement. If the implicit statement turns out to be untrue, then there may be misrepresentation. See Spice Girls vs. Aprilia World Service from 2000. This case is worth looking into. The case involved the iconic 90s girl group, the Spice Girls. The group signed a sponsorship agreement but subsequently resisted payment saying that one of the five, Jerry, also known as Ginger Spice, had given notice to leave the group, substantially changing what has been promised. 
The girls acknowledged that Jerry had said she would leave but insisted that no real intention to leave had existed. The court accepted that the person who is about to enter into an agreement is under no duty to disclose material facts which she knows but which the other party does not know. Here, however, the group knew that the other party was relying upon a representation that was false and were, as a consequence, liable in damages. Secondly, where a statement which is untrue has been made and it becomes false as a result of a change of circumstances, keeping silent may be treated as a misrepresentation. See With vs. Flanagan from 1936. Additionally, there are some contracts which are treated as being of the utmost good faith. This means that the parties are obligated to disclose the relevant information even if it's not asked. See, for example, Lambert vs. Cooperative Insurance Society from 1975. There are four different categories of misrepresentation, which relate principally to the state of mind of the person making the statement. First of all, we have fraudulent. The maker of the statement knows or believes that the statement is untrue or makes it not caring whether it's true or false. We have negligence at common law. Here, the maker of the statement and the person relying on it are in a special relationship, giving a rise to a duty of care under the principles of Hedley Byrne v. Heller from 1964, and the maker of the statement acts in breach of this duty. Statutory misrepresentation means that the maker of the statement has no reasonable grounds for believing it to be true. This is defined in Section 2.1 of the Misrepresentation Act of 1967. See also Foster v. Action Aviation from, from 2013. Innocent misrepresentation occurs in the case where the maker of the statement genuinely believes it to be true and does not act negligently at common law or under the statute in making that statement. The distinction between these categories is vital in determining the remedies which may be available to the person relying on the statement. We are now going to move on to consider the types of remedies that are available for misrepresentation depending on its type and circumstances. The remedies available for misrepresentation will depend on whether it was made innocently, negligently or fraudulently. There are potential remedies available under the common law, both in contract and tort, and under the statute. This is the Misrepresentation Act of 1967. The main categories of remedy are first, rescission of the contract, and secondly, damages for losses resulted, resulting from the misrepresentation. Rescission is the principal common law remedy for misrepresentation which induced a contract. This was and is still available whether the representation was innocent, negligent or fraudulent. A rescission in this context means that the contract is set aside and the parties are put in a position where they would have been if the contract had never been made. Any goods or money which have been exchanged must be returned. The remedy of rescission must be sought by the claimant. It does not occur automatically. It is important to remember here that misrepresentation renders a contract voidable rather than void. There are some situations also where the right to rescind will be lost. These are where a party to a contract, aware of the other party's misrepresentation, continues with the contract and thus affirms it. See Long v. Lloyd from 1958. Also, where there is a significant lapse of time between the making of the contract and the discovery of the misrepresentation, see for instance Leaf v. International Galleries from 1950. Where a restitution is impossible, you might also lose the right for rescission for misrepresentation. Since the idea of rescission is to restore the parties to the position they would have been if the contract had not been made, if property which has been transferred has been consumed or mixed with other property, rescission will not be permitted. See Clark v. Dixon from 1858. Finally, where a rescission would affect the rights of a third party, it might not be possible. The most obvious example is where goods have been sold to the misrepresentor who has then sold them on to an innocent third party before the contract has been avoided. As regards damages, the common law was late in recognizing a right to damages for non-fraudulent misrepresentations. An innocent misrepresentation provided only an indemnity for necessary expenditures incurred as part of the contract rescinded by way of monetary compensation. See, for example, Whittington versus Seal from 1900. 
where a misrepresentation is fraudulent, damages may be recoverable under the tort action for deceit. This requires the claimant to prove that the statement had been made knowingly untrue, without any genuine belief in its truth, or with reckless disregard for whether it was true. See Derry v. Peake from 1889. The law of tort in Hedley Byrne v. Heller from 1964 eventually recognized that a negligent misstatement which caused economic loss could be actionable. The action that has developed from this provides another potential remedy for a person who has entered into a contract as a result of negligent misstatement from the other party. The most important innovation of the Misrepresentation Act of 1967 was the introduction of the action for what is generally referred to as negligent misrepresentation in Section 2.1. In fact, the Act does not use this technology, but provides that a statement which would form the basis of an action in deceit, if made fraudulently, will also give rise to liability unless the person making it is able to prove that he had reasonable grounds for making that statement. This means that they believe the statement and the facts represented to be true. As to the burden of proof, all that the claimant has to do is prove that a misrepresentation was made and that it induced the contract. The defendant would then be liable for damages under Section 2.1 unless he can prove that there were reasonable grounds for his or her belief that the statement was true. See Howard Marine and Dredging Co. v. Ogden from 1978. As regards the measure of damages, the most important authority is Roy Scott Trust v. Rogerson from 1991. Here it was held by the Court of Appeal that damages under Section 2.1 should be calculated in the same way as if the statements have been made fraudulently. Section 2.2 of the Misrepresentation Act provides a discretion for a court to award damages in lieu of rescission, where it is judged equitable to do so, taking account of the effect of rescission on both parties. The exclusion or limitation of liability for misrepresentation is dealt with by Section 3 of the Misrepresentation Act 1967 as amended by Section 8 of the Unfair Contract Terms Act 1997. This requires that any clause which attempts to limit liability for misrepresentation must satisfy the requirement of reasonableness set out in Section 11 of the Unfair Contract Terms Act. See Aurora Fine Arts Investment from 2012. Broad attempts to exclude liability have been found to be unreasonable, even if the clauses are drawn from widely used standard terms and conditions. Sometimes the attempt to exclude liability is put into the form of an assertion, for example that no statements are made other than those contained in the, con contained in the contract itself. Such entire agreement clauses have been considered in a number of cases. Although there is an early authority on the pre- Unfair Contract Terms Act version of Section 3, which held that there a clause would be effective to restrict liability for statements made by an agent, by agent of the party concerned, uh, for example as in Overbrook Estates versus Glencomb from 1974, subsequent cases have generally taken the line that an entire agreement clause or clauses which attempt to deny that there is any reliance on pre-contractual statements do not fall within the scope of Section A as far as liability for misrepresentation is concerned. The conclusion is that these clauses would not be successful in protecting a party from a misrepresentation claim. Under the Consumer Rights Act of 2015, a new concept of a consumer notice has been introduced. See Part 2 of the Act on Unfair Terms. This means that anything which sets out the rights or obligations of the trader and consumer or restricts the trader's liability will be subject to the same test of fairness as if it were set out in the trader's terms and conditions. This will apply to marketing communications, brochures, and stores, and signs at the premises, all of which will be treated in the same way as if they were contractual terms. Anything said or written to a consumer about a service or trader, whether by or on behalf of the trader, will be treated as a term of the contract if the consumer takes it into account when deciding whether to enter into the contract, any decision about the services after the contract is entered into. This makes it a great deal easier for consumers to bring claims which would previously have been pursued under the law of misrepresentation.